Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome to our APEX lecture today. Uh, almost a year ago, we were slated to hear Donovan Livingston speak, and obviously COVID um, shut everything down, so we're really happy to have him speak to us today. Uh, Donovan, Donovan Livingston is an award-winning educator, spoken word poet, and public speaker. In 2016, Donovan Livingston delivered a convocation speech to the Harvard Graduate School of Education that went viral and received national acclaim. His spoken word address was at once a pointed ex examination of the American education system and an inspirational call for reform. Since his pivotal speech, Livingston has been featured on CNN, NPR, BBC, Good Morning America, and in news outlets across Europe, Australia, India, and South Africa. His convocation address was published as a book by Spiegel and Grau in 2017. A believer in the enormous opportunities that education provides, Livingston inspires students, educators, and communities with his conviction that every child has the right to lift off and achieve their dreams. Drawing on personal experiences as well as scholarship, Livingston examines the role of culture, hip hop, and spoken word poetry and student experiences in higher education and post-secondary education. Livingston has earned master's degrees from Columbia University and Harvard University and a PhD from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro in educational leadership and cultural foundations. He lives in Winston-Salem, North Carolina with his wife, Lauren, and daughter, Joy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Donovan Livingston. Hello, 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 and good afternoon, family. Um, I hope uh, everyone is doing well. Thank you so much for taking the time to fellowship with me uh, this afternoon. Um, I, I'm, I'm humbled to be a, a part of this group, part of this audience. Just if I could backtrack for a second, I was uh, slated to, 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 to fellowship with you uh, around this time last year, but had that been the case, um, you know, we were just in the onset of the pandemic, I was just becoming a father. I wasn't even a dad yet when um, this happened. Joy just just turned one recently, and uh, I just finished my PhD in the time between now and then. So I wouldn't have been a doctor, wouldn't have been a dad, whole different slate of circumstances, but I'm so grateful that um, this is the time that we were able to, to spend together. And if you ask me, I think we're right on time uh, for this fellowship and this journey uh, together. So again, thank you for having me, thank you for warming me up. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, uh, Dean. Um, I, I do want to, before we get uh, too ahead of ourselves, I do want to uh, put everything into context, right? So um, I want to acknowledge the loss of life uh, that we've experienced um, in Atlanta this week and in Boulder um, and all this year in lieu of the pandemic. It's a privilege for us to be here to reflect on the nature of schooling in these hallowed halls. Um, and to that, I say, let us also not forget the loss of life the sacrifice and suffering that made this moment uh, in all of our lives possible. Um, so please join me in a brief uh, moment of reflection before we get into um, uh, our remarks for today. So please take a minute and bow. Thank you. Now, when I say hip, y'all say hop, hip. Okay, wherever you at in the world, I'm gonna assume you was calling response with me. I just want you to be on your toes. So I'm a, I'm a rapper and I'm, I'm an MC, I'm a poet, I'm a professor, scholar, whatever. I'm a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, the MC part really, really, really comes out uh, when I'm sharing space with, with, with family and friends like yourself. So if I call you family today, know that that's genuine. If I call you fam, if I call you homies, like know that I mean that and know that uh, it, it, it is not me up here speaking to you today. This is a, I expect this and hope this to be a, a mutual exchange. So before we get into um, uh, the official remarks, I do wanna kick things off with a little poetry. Um, it, and you know, as we explore, I'm gonna talk today really about reimagining 
uh, what success looks like in higher education, both for students and administrators and faculty. But as we explore the nature of higher education in its current landscape, um, and I offer some thoughts on where we go from here, I too uh, do not want to forget about the nature of hope and uh, what it means to create moments in school for hope to thrive and how students and educators can work together to co-create hope in tandem. Um, so bear with me while I get into it. And if any point you hear anything you like, you vibe with or appreciate, I just need you wherever you at in the world to join me in a few steps. It makes, it makes a poet feel good, all right? So without further ado, let's get into it. Hope. People ask me about her like we homies. Like we go way back, like four flats on a Cadillac, let the windows down so my do-rag flaps in the breeze. Like we were OGs and Hope and I had our own handshake. We twist our fingers, sing each other's praises, holler phrases like, you don't want it with our block. Like we were neighbors and Hope was the big house on the hill with the gate and the swimming pool. You ask about Hope like we still cool. Like I ain't looking for her too. Like she ain't did me like she did you, yeah. There were times we been tight, like pinky swears on spent nights, like hoping I share secrets. Like we know each other's weakness. People ask me for my thesis, my theory, like I'm privy to hope in her whereabouts. Like I'm an expert in her and her complexities, checking my phone like y'all she texting me, but her messages be emojis, an upside down smiley, a blown kiss. Hope's known to play me when I reminisce, always on some new phone, who this? Every time I press send. You asked me about hope like we were once lovers, like I wasn't crushing, like I wasn't running stuff in notes in her locker with do you like me boxes being awkward and walking away. I don't know what y'all want me to say about hope and where she been at. Like she's the fire in my synapse, trapped in my syntax. In fact, I see her face in every cipher. So I write like a medium leading seance sonnets and summon hope from beyond the grave. Like she ain't dead to me. I read between every line, resurrected me still feeling hopeless, an open book in a library of unspoken stories. Tell me, do you know the difference between a ghost and an angel? And if hope is the distance from a broken spirit and mended heart, if so, how far are we from the truth, the bastard youth of mother earth and father time, whose bottom line is we die a little bit every day, but capable of rendering hope in a world that tells you anything but, that says this rut we're in is temporary and every promise is another sweet nothing tumbling down your ear canal somehow. Hope's whispers wake slumbering giants. Those Goliath-sized obstructions that just won't go away, that made the loophole in the 13th Amendment wide enough for my head and neck, left me hanging, left my crew hanging, swinging from new trees, slinging rock like David, praying I bring this behemoth to his knees. I don't know hope as well as y'all think. That's why I keep slingshots in each pocket. I've been knocking from the hull of their ships, hurling stones from the cargo hold at their glass houses and ceilings, dodging falling shards, feeling like Philistines when the giant from Gath met his match. I gathered the Scattered, shattering glass, grounded to ashes, a phoenix rising from your past. The fire in my eyes sees hope as an eternal flame, our burning desire to save the world. But Lord knows we are no saviors. Instead, just mere purveyors of hope. Even though we are on speaking terms these days, our dialogue be one-sided. At night with closed eyelids, trying to dream our way back in her good graces. I hate to say this, but hope, hope closely resembles despair. And where there's blight and blunder, wonder and light shine most vibrant, hope is violent. It's violets and roses and love and war and torn pages that make poems sound more like battle cries, like you don't have to die, you don't have to die, you don't have to die. Just find five stones, lock and load it, write it in a notebook and show your opponent who's boss till adversity get lost. You forgot your pen is almighty, smiting down all that threatens your freedom, fighting demons seen and unseen. I seem to know about hope because I spoke to the other side. And you're right. Some days I'm David, courageous, taking stances. Today, I'm more like sway without the answers, but chances are hope is as close as my own two hands. Peace and love, y'all. Let's get into it. Woo! Thank you. Oh, there's people there. This is great, y'all. Straight up, man. This is my first like live event where I can like hear audible feedback. So just know that's feeding my soul right now. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And shout out to Lynn Vartan for all of your help. If you wouldn't mind queuing up the first slide for me, fam, that would be fantastic. Oh. Donovan, that was just fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. And 
I just, uh, I'm so excited for your words. And we are, of course, sad that you're not here in person, but so honored to be spending this time with you and to be sharing your art and your passion. So thank you. The feeling is certainly mutual, Lynn. Thank you so much for, for, for making me feel right at home, literally and, you know, metaphorically speaking. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> so thank you so much. Again, my name is Donovan Livingston. I bring you greetings from uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, where I am assistant dean and lecturer at Wake Forest University. Um, my wife sends you love, Joy. Uh, baby girl, she sends you love too. Um, really excited to kick it with y'all this afternoon, or this afternoon over here, this morning, uh, around your way um, on inspiring galaxies with greatness, rocketing toward remixes for higher education. Um, I'm from Fayetteville, Fayetteville. Any J. Cole fans out there, we're the same hometown. And the way I view and way I um, interact with uh, higher education is very much through the lens of hip hop and hip hop performance. So without further ado, let's, let's get into it. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna kick things off today with a quote uh, from President Harry Truman. Um, interesting, interesting figure in American history for, for several reasons, but his outlook on education is really what sparks uh, my interest to start here today. Um, in 1947, uh, President Truman uh, writes, if the ladder of educational opportunity rises high at the doors of some youth and scarcely at the doors of others, while at the same time, formal education is made a prerequisite to occupational and social advance, then education may become the means not of eliminating race and class distinctions, but of deepening and solidifying them. I, wanna, I want you to, to, to sit with that. Let that resonate with you for a second. This idea that President Truman is re wrestling with here is very much connected to our current day or contemporary understandings of uh, American meritocracy. It's the idea that the ruling class, those in power, the wealthiest 1%, um, those who control sort of discourse and, and everything we see in the world today, the ruling class, it must be populated with highly credentialed, educated people, which in turn, bars access to power, or that is that idea, that antiquated, often untrue uh, mantra of pulling oneself up from, from, uh, by their bootstraps, right? It, this idea of the American meritocracy, um, this idea of over-credentialing, and I'm saying this to you as a, as a PhD graduate too, right? So, you know, I, I, I both drink the Kool-Aid, but also understand, approach this from a critical lens. It's the idea that um, the more credentials folks have, those are the folks who deserve are more deserving of power. And that is certainly certainly not the case in, in school, that is colleges and universities for the most part are seen as sort of uh, barriers to or pathways to wealth and economic opportunity more so than not pursuing uh, a college degree. Interestingly enough, Harry Truman is the one of nine presidents that did not pursue any form of higher education. He's the only president in modern US history that is post-World War II era um, that did not have a college degree. And so how he, a blue collar, working class American with very minor uh, political aspirations ascended to the presidency is almost unthinkable in modern times. There's some degree of, 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 of racialized understanding of why that might be um, the case or why I was able to ascend, but that's a lecture for another day. I wanna focus on this and, and we can certainly move forward to the next slide. Um, that, that gets more specific into where we're coming into today's conversation. So what you see here, hopefully not all too blurry, but what you see here is um, I want to reflect on the utility of higher, higher education. What's the purpose? Why are we here? And what mechanisms are in place for students who see themselves as a part of uh, uh, what happens in colleges and universities and, and want to further their, their love of lifelong learning. Like how do they navigate the pathway to get to where they wanna be? And what you see here is um, uh, the results of a 2019 NACAC survey. NACAC is the National Association of College Admissions Counselors. This um, report is really fascinating to me. What they do is they, they reach out to some 220 um, college admissions professionals from across the country uh, to sort of survey to see what elements of the college application are most important to them. They, they rank these from considerable importance being obviously most important to no importance, meaning they had very little weight in the uh, student's admissions decisions. And so of the 220 um, admissions counselors that were uh, surveyed, these were the results. I want you to take, take, a, take a minute to get familiar with this, notice what you see in the top five, what jumps out to you, what resonates, um, I'll talk to you a little bit about what uh, is poignant for me. Um, so, you know, obviously the top five is, might be no surprise, like 
the grades in your college prep courses, the strength of the classes you take, which is fascinating because a lot of schools aren't, schools aren't created equal, right? So where one school might offer 12 AP classes, another might only offer one. And what, what uh, impact does that have on students from these different backgrounds who are applying to um, these different environments, these different uh, colleges, and they're worried uh, if they can measure up to other students from other places who may be more affluent, right? So um, the strength in college prep courses is really important to think about. The SAT, ACT, um, you know, obviously holds considerable weight. Uh, one thing I will say about uh, some admissions offices across the country, they are moving to test optional. Wake Forest is one of those test, test optional institutions. But as we know, there is a long history of socially and racially biased um, standardized tests in the form of the SAT and the ACT. So it's still, although we know that to be true, they, they still hold a considerable weight in the admissions process. And then you know, the essay, the essay, uh, you know, when I'm working with, I come from a college access background. So I've worked with first gen, low income, undocumented, historically underrepresented students across higher education, right? And working with their those students and families, the essay is really one of those few areas where a student can actually speak up for themselves. You know, they may have had a tough freshman year and been trying to pull their, pull themselves up ever since then, but that essay is, is the bread and butter, right? It's the one chance the student can say in their own words who they believe themselves to be and what contributions they can make. And it still doesn't hold the same importance as say grades or strength of curriculum. Now also, uh, you might notice extracurricular activities only accounted for 6.4% of considerable importance. If you were like me and have been working every day of your life since you were 15 years old, uh, you know, work only accounted for 4.1% of considerable importance. And that for me, especially for students I work with who actively have jobs in order to contribute to their household, right? Like working, not working was not an option. And so because colleges, because these, at least the admissions counselors polled in this survey, only accounted that for 4.1 percent of their uh, of considerable importance. That jumped out to me as um, uh, an injustice to those students who might have more um, significant financial needs um, as they, you know, move throughout the application process. But I show this to you to say um, when students arrive at this point, when they're applying to college and they're at the pinnacle at the time of their educational journey, I just marvel at how much um, of what they're led to believe about uh, themselves as students is shaped by these metrics that don't reflect the whole of who they are. Um, and when students arrive in our care as college as college professionals, as professors, as uh, faculty and staff, um, it's important that we also seek opportunities when they get here to remind them that their self-worth is so much deeper than what you see on this graph. Um, next slide, please. And so that's where hip hop comes in, or it came in for me. So um, hip hop is grounded in these core principles. Uh, hip hop you know, it's, it's still a relatively new cultural phenomenon. Um, it, it's argued that the first hip hop party or the hip hop was first invented at a house party in the basement of a building in the South Bronx on August 11th, 1973. And ever since then, it's it's taken the world by storm. Um, but not, not to get too much into hip hop history, but I do want to give you some context and some foundational knowledge. So who you see here is Africa Bambata, um, one of the originators of of the uh, 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 scratching and extending break beats on on disco records to make them longer so people could dance, can vibe, can party. And, you know, hip hop was really born in this set of uh, 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 sort of urban decay, um, urban blights, uh, these social conditions that were manufactured uh, by systemic forces, right? But it, hip hop gave youth in that time and today an outlet to express themselves, their frustration, their happiness, their joy. And uh, a lot of times when we think about hip hop, we only think about rap and rap music, which is not the fullness of what the hip hop cultural experience is. And African Mambada says a lot of times when people say hip hop, they don't know what they're talking about. They just think of the rappers. When you talk about hip hop, you're talking about the whole culture and the movement. You have to take the whole culture for what it is. And when he says that, he's talking about the art of DJ or turntabling, right? Scratching, sampling, taking record, old records and turning them into something new. DJing is a core element of a performative element of hip hop. You also have um, graffiti, uh, which is sort of hip hop's visual aesthetic, right? The, 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 the way you sort of see the world turning a, a wall into a new canvas, right? Like hip, graffiti is hip hop's visual aesthetic, just as DJ, DJing is hip hop's auditory aesthetic, MCing or rapping, that's hip hop's lyrical aesthetic. Again, that's what a lot of folks traditionally associate with what hip hop is, 
rap music is, again, just a small part uh, uh, of the uh, core performative elements. And certainly last but not least, you have breaking or break dancing, b-boying or b-girling, it's also uh, what it was known as. But that's the embodied aesthetic, right? That ability to dance, that ability to pop lock, do things with the body, understanding that the hip hop, that hip hop culture is a full body experience that captivates all of the senses. And those elements are tethered together by these core principles of peace, love, unity, and having fun. Now, when I say words, you say matter. Words matter. Hey, when I say language is, you say power. Language is power. Exactly. Thank you so much, Lynn. If you could advance to the next slide. And so when I say that call and response, I really want to just define what I mean. I want to say what I mean. Mean what I say and say what I mean, right? So when I say peace, love, unity, and having fun, I simply mean this. So I, I approach peace from this uh, perspective of Martin Luther King. In a sermon in 1956, he writes, or he, he says, uh, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. So when we talk peace, when I talk peace through this hip hop perspective, I'm not just saying like, you know, show love, peace, be peaceful, be kind to one another. It's so much deeper than that. Peace is accountability, right? Peace is calling people out when they, they do you wrong. Peace is speaking truth to power, right? So when an institution mistreats uh, a body of individuals, right? It's us having the courage to stand up for uh, marginalized folks, even when they aren't in the room. That is peace. Peace is taking, um, taking a look at your neighbor and seeing yourself reflected in them. It's this idea of collectivism. It's this idea that what happens to you inherently happens to me. And in order to achieve peace, we can't just shy away from that which makes us uncomfortable. We need to lean into it. That is what we mean when we say peace. And that's what I mean when I say peace um, through hip hop. Let's talk about love. Um, Audre Lorde, one of my favorite writers, um, Feminist, uh, queer scholar, uh, late Audre Lorde. Uh, I, I call, I like to call her Auntie Audrey. Um, but um, uh, Audre Lorde on, has so much to say about love. But I thought this quote was really uh, captured what I was getting at when we say peace, love, unity, and having fun. She writes, "Once we recognize it is what it is we are feeling. Once we recognize we can feel deeply, love deeply, can feel joy. When we will demand that, all parts of our lives produce that kind of joy. Love." is a kind conduit to joy that is sustained happiness, sustained harmony across all facets of our lived experience, right? And when I say hip hop as a lens, I mean these, these principles, but I also mean how can these principles apply to what we do as higher ed professionals and students in a college setting, right? So if we don't love what we do, if we don't love where we're at, if we don't love our major, if we don't love the students we teach, if we don't show up in love, certain parts of our experience are going to fall by the wayside. And then how can the institution support that student? So love is something that is essential to their experience and not something that's um, an exception to the rule. Love is not an exception, it's required. Um, and then finally, unity. I think having fun speaks for itself, but I wanna talk unity real quick. Uh, lean on uh, brother Malcolm X when he writes, um, we need more light about each other. Light creates understanding, understanding creates love. Love creates patience and patience creates unity, right? Unity is this, this willingness to work with one another, even if we're not on the same page right now, right? It's just a, a agreement to uh, work across difference, to engage counterculturally. It's to see the value in how someone else sees the world, so long as that the way they see the world doesn't dehumanize you and who you are, right? Because that's where disagreement happens. I'm thinking of uh, James Baldwin, right? Like he, he, he often talks about um, how, um, uh, we can disagree so long as your disagreement is doesn't compromise my humanity. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. But um, unity is where you can have the tough conversations so long as you agree to love and agree to peace and agree to have fun engaging in this discourse. Um, and Lynn, you're more than welcome to advance to the next slide. Um, so I want to get into uh, what hip hop meant to me in a college space. So as an artist, I started writing I started writing uh, rap, spoken word, seriously in the 11th grade. And when I got to college, when I went on a tour, I saw the spoken word poetry group perform. And I was like, that's when I knew the school I was going to was the school I was going to. Because they had a space for me to sort of express that and explore it in ways that I wasn't allowed to or able to either at home or in high school. So um, what I want to do today is sort of, again, give you a sense of the fullness of the hip hop experience by, by saying mic check. 
I hover precarious over my stereo cassette deck, too vexed to press record, too absorbed to turn back. I had an obsession, a progressed infatuation that quickly consumed my heart. It started as a couplet, all rhyme but no reason. But there was freedom in those bars, the instrument of my escape, a liberation of sorts as Nas words paraded from the speakers in grand procession, a cavalcade of parables that pervaded my senses, reminded me of my existence with each sentence depicting what would happen if I ruled the world. Imagine that. So I graffiti tag it on my memory's wall. So when they call it vandalism, I call it art. I say it's poetry, an opus for the beleaguered yet unbroken who still measure time and notes with no half step in, only giant steps like Coltrane, like Big Daddy Kane, composed as William Grant still, steady, unmoved by crescendoing hate speech. We made time machines of break beats. See hip hop be the soundtrack to our history. She waded in the water, followed the drinking gourd, the original remix that made soul food of massive scraps, then came back to own her masters, y'all. She sounds like irony, she sounds like a higher being to me. Every microphone is God's ear pressed against my plight, and he listens, she listens. Sometimes God tells me to pump up the volume since my salvation's been paid in full, and that's word to rock him. So I rock this mic like I say my prayers, like there's an intimate direct line to the infinite with instrumental sampling every sentiment. Our pain, our diligence, our resilience in the face of adversity, our mercy, grace, frustration, and impatience for a justice that was long overdue. As DJ Cool hurt cue the vibe that was it was, it was, it was, it was made from scratch. <laughs> Y'all, it was in counterculture. This is our culture over a dope beat, and I can't stop, won't stop. When I say hip, y'all say hop, hip. Hop. Hey, it's a call and response from beyond the grave. After all, I hear our chains and tambourines. These ghetto gospels jingle like the keys of DJ Khaled. In fact, I see the noose body in your Harlem shake, desperately gasping for air. I hear the snare drum of Quest Love and every crack of a whip and kickback from Darren Wilson's standard issue pistol. Can I live? Can I live? But in this battle, it seems I found immortality. Despite their best efforts, I am C. I am C. Look, y'all ain't hearing me. I am C. I can be metaphorically cunning, mad creative, a storyteller, the middle class, mainstream, castigated, maimed and castrated, yet in these pages I emerge in mint condition, masterful communicators long before we were mere chattel, making connections, metacognitive between the past and future, producing more critical, often mistaken criminals who manifest clarity in every lyric we write. As we undo your mass confusion, we more closely resemble model citizens, speaking our minds consistently, engaging you in meaningful conversation. As far as music's concerned, I am C. See, hip hop is a movie. And some days it's the truest thing I've ever known. When I hear a dope verse, I still furrow my brow and somehow those wrinkles in my forehead form a map to my inner peace. So you can find me somewhere lost between side A and side B. Peace and love. Let's keep it moving, y'all. <laughs> Woo! Woo! So, hip hop was everything. And uh, in college, I was able to sort of find this community um, of, of, of artists um, that made me feel like a whole person, right? So I was a, a, in a spoken word poetry troupe. I, that troupe I saw perform when I visited on my campus tour, I actually auditioned for my freshman year and made it and eventually became president. And it was, it was amazing. We, we did spoken word poetry. We, we, we wrote dramas, we wrote plays and performed poetry and character. Like I really got a chance to tap into a part of myself that I didn't know existed. And then, you know, I started rapping. I opened for some of my favorite artists when they came to campus. It was fantastic. This was me, y'all. It's not really me, but it was like me when I entered undergrad. This is how I felt. This is how you feel when you get in. Everybody love you. They showering you, throwing rose petals at your feet. It's amazing, right? And Lynn, you could go to the next slide. This is when you get in, but when you get out. <laughs> Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Thank you so much, Lynn. I I I didn't know sort of um what I was getting myself into, right? Let's yeah. keep it going to the next slide. And I'll explain to get out a little bit more. So what you see here is a screenshot of your boy's transcript. Now, normally I don't let this thing out in public too much. I'm just playing. I, I'm, I'm an open book, right? So it's fine. What you see here is my transcript, and I'm gonna allow you a few minutes to sort of imagine if you were me. What was your GPA first semester freshman year? All right, I'm gonna let you sit with that for a second, knowing that, you know, the high school I went to, 
it, I, I, I enjoy my high school experience. I did fantastic when I was in high school, you know, top 10%, student body president, homecoming, all that. Like that was me. I was, I was that person in high school. Um, and so I felt like when I transitioned to college, that same energy, that same vibe, that same affect when I showed up in that school setting would somehow miraculously translate to my experience in college. And lo and behold, Lynn, if you could uh, go to the next slide, that was certainly not the case. <laughs> I had a one point, is y'all laughing? I hear y'all laughing all the way over here, man. It's cool though, <laughs> we still family, y'all still cousins, it's all good. Um, but I had a 1.2 GPA my first semester freshman year. Luckily I had, I say luckily, but I took um, two classes in a summer program called Summer Bridge um, for a lot of first gen um, uh, students of color, uh, historically underrepresented communities. They had a Summer Bridge program for us um, to get our feet wet so we could you know easily transition into college i did well in summer bridge and thankfully the grades i got in summer bridge kept me from flunking out my first semester freshman year so i had a 1.2 that first semester but my cumulative gpa was a 1.6 now i'm gonna ask y'all another question that you could ruminate on what would you think the cutoff was for being placed on academic probation you guessed it if you if you are hovering around a 1.5 you are absolutely correct so i was a tenth of a point away from blowing it all. And that was, you know, in part, I'm not going to sit up here and say I wasn't complicit in some of this, right? Like I was trying to figure myself out, like how to balance the, the parties and the freedom and the just finding myself in this new environment. But I'd be remiss to say that there weren't institutional characteristics that reminded me or made me feel as though where I was was not where I belonged. And Lynn, you could advance the, to the next slide. Um, and so what I'm going to do, I have two, two more pieces here that sort of break that down. This first piece uh, entitled Note to Self, um, reflects on some of the more um, uh, uh, individual sort of um, individual responsibility I took or was taking over my experience. The second piece, Lux Libertas, um, focuses more on some of the systemic barriers that precluded my success um, when I transitioned to college. So uh, without further ado, this is Note to Self. I wrote a letter to myself during my freshman year of college. It was a letter to me in the future. I wrote about how, bruh, you should be a doctor by now. Someone's boss, CEO bound, a profound leader in your field, dog, the first black something. Then Obama happened. <laughs> and I had to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> now, you haven't lived until you've walked in someone else's dream. <laughs> Wiped the crust from your own eyes and realized your first rude awakening. In college, your boy slept in one too many mornings. Hit the snooze button so nothing was left but a bunch of failed tests and excuses that were useless when I looked at my professor and he told me, you don't belong at this institution. Reconsider, young man. I was 19 the first time I wanted to drop out. I had my home number dialed in my phone, but something told me not to press same. If I could have written a letter to me now, back then, I would have told myself that every morning you rise, you've already defied an odd, even if the best you can do is finish. You've been given an opportunity to skew their data, tell them they were wrong about you. Every morning you rise, you do so with a renewed mind. And yes, sometimes it'll be harder than others. There'll be nights you won't forget and nights you'll lament. You'll break a heart or two till the part of you feels lost. Like you drifted so far from shore, you'll capsize in an ocean of your own tears. You try to drown your sorrows, bother your lungs for gills because you feel like being submerged in temptation makes the most sense, but let it go because you were born to succeed swimmingly. Today, you do more than stay afloat. Instead of just keeping your head above water, you learn to harbor the dreams of your ancestors. Back bent, picking cotton, that pain that shot through your lower lumbar was them knocking, reminding you that you have the right to be been over and leave no stone unturned too many times. You question your integrity, your intelligence, even your very presence at this school, but don't let it get to you. Selective hearing will be your most effective tool. Sure, there'll be days you feel like you're here to fill a quota. Yeah, they know what standards just for you. They'll assume your position, point guard, shooting guard, shoot. You must play ball. But all that ever mattered in life is how you power forward. Don't look back. Yes, there'll be days you'll feel like strange fruit hanging from the rim, a waste of height. But make no mistake, your goals were more than 10 feet high. Sometimes you have to remind yourself to shoot for the stars because your problems are merely constellations, shimmering images of what made you beautiful, brilliant, a resilient representation of your mother, father, sister, brother, uh, uncle, cousin, whatever village that raised you and gave you life. So turn your tassel without turning your back on the place that made you. Your name is not the only one on that diploma. So go forth 
and prosper, but work. You work until your GPA sounds less like a grade point average and more like God's purpose in action. All we have is faith. And I pray you step out daily, unafraid of becoming you, because life's a university, but the intuition is free. So spend your time like money and use it wisely, finding your voice. Sincerely, Dr. Livingston. Yeah, woo, yeah. So, so just, to, just to reiterate, um, that actually happened. I actually had uh, a white male professor say to me, and it, and it was in a history course, which was my major in undergrad, um, uh, he said to me that I did not belong in college. This is at the end of the semester, my sophomore year, first semester. Um, I got a D in his class. And, you know, this was around the time, sophomore year, I started to get the hang of how to ask for help, normalizing those help-seeking behaviors, really starting to take sort of matters into my own hands in ways I did not my freshman year. So sophomore year, I thought I was, thought I was on to something, right? And, you know, I get this bad grade in a class that I was, you know, sort of that I was majoring in. And he hits me with the you don't belong here conversation um, uh, at the at the end of, of that semester. And that, that, that really, it hurt, but in the moment, I didn't interpret it as such. I pocketed that comment and saved it and just kept pulling it out whenever I needed a little bit of motivation, a, a, something that light a fire under me. And, you know, I didn't have the language of social justice. I didn't know how to talk. I didn't know how to speak truth to power or report anybody or report bias or anything like that. So I internalized it. And if I could speak to that version of myself, I would encourage a little more pushback. But I internalized it and, and it motivated me, perhaps negatively, but um, I think it's important to know that even when you feel like you're, you're on the right track, there are certain things at the schools we're attending or the schools we um, uh, the, the, the schools we, we, we uh, facilitate um, or the moments in education that we facilitate that can really set a student back um, in ways that we might not realize. And so this next piece, uh, Lux Libertas, is a note not to that professor, but another professor who, you know, this is when it really started to click that maybe the, the way this place works has something to do with why I'm not performing um, up to snuff. Your body is dangling over a laptop. It is midnight. Your assignment is due tomorrow. Well, technically today, your eyes are glazed. <laughs> you crave donuts, a Red Bull, Monster, something stronger. It's all a familiar scene. You rest your fingers against the home row keys, A, S, D. You'll be in Hinton James' third floor kitchen, staring at an unwritten thesis, wishing you had telekinesis because spoken words can hardly convey how you feel in this moment. You've been in a margin so long, you won't know where to begin. You will title your midterm in defense of slavery and want to crawl out of your own skin. You will bury yourself in the text, read between the lines until you see your own ghost. You will be haunted by a prompt printing premonitions of apparitions past history 586, remembering Dixie. Professor say this paper ain't gonna write itself. You're too terrified to ask for help. You will run through a laundry list of affirmations before concluding white supremacy is a stain that won't soon be removed, yet we wear it every day like Carolina blue. You will wonder who didn't struggle with this assignment. Who finds the economic model of the old South to be fit, frugal, fiscally conservative, then have the nerve to smile in your face, say you're created equal, and treat you as if microaggressions are mere myth, like they don't exist in 12-point times, New Roman double space, five pages with annotations. You'll wish they would have told you this at orientation. How your acceptance letter will soon feel like a bill of sale. You will envision the institution through new eyes and not be surprised by what you see. You will wonder how many slaves it took to build Old East. How many bricks bear our blood today will feel like 1793. They'll say you're crazy for being offended as if being, as if being the only black student isn't oddly necrophilic. Like black bodies still don't fill up old Chapel Hill cemeteries, unmarked graves. You will avoid walking that way for the rest of the semester because you are ashamed. From now on, the rustling magnolia leaves will sound like broken bones. You will enroll in classes held in buildings bearing names of Klansmen. Every paper you write will feel like a ransom note when the university boasts about being the only Southern institution to remain open during the Civil War. You and you alone will ask, for whom were our students fighting? You will learn of George Moses Horton 
an enslaved person who purchases freedom from the university by selling poems to male students. <laughs> There we go. Sorry about that. I should have had my thing off. Where was I? Uh, you will learn of George Moses Horton, an enslaved person who purchases freedom from the university by selling poems to male students to send home to their lovers. And never again will you wonder if words possess the power of beating hearts. How a couplet is its own liberation song. You will know the road to justice is long, but it starts here. You will bend under the mighty weight of history, but you will not break. You will write this paper beating your backspace button into oblivion, a billion sentences worth of sentiments you do not believe. And for your trouble, for your trouble, young man, you will earn a B. Your professor, your professor. He will earn an undergraduate teaching award, the designation of distinguished faculty, and you will laugh at the sadistic irony that is light and liberty, rigidly carved on a university crest at the expense of your identity or however much of it is left. Peace and love. Woo! Woo! You know, I think it was my professor calling me, but you know, I don't know, I, I declined. We good. We good. <laughs> But thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, again, I think it's really important that we, you know, take an inventory of how our students are feeling as they navigate the spaces we intend to create. Although we, you know, create as higher ed professionals, we create spaces with the best of intentions, right? Um, but sometimes we miss the mark and we have to own when that happens. And so I very much was in a history of the old South class as a sophomore. Um, I was the highest level history class I had taken at that point. And um, I was the only black student. And one of the assignments was literally write a paper defending the institution of slavery or you know, write about uh, slavery from an economic standpoint and justify its means um, as a viable model for, for, for running the economy of the form of confederacy, which was a tough thing to do. I humble myself to do it. But at the same time, I think about other students, right, who might not have the language to articulate how uh, deleterious that is to one sense of self, one sense of affirmation. A student who might not have a space to reflect on these things with their peers, right, could be in a very different place than I was at this time uh, because I had a supportive community to help really hash that out. So you could advance to the next slide. Man. Thank you. So for my faculty out there who are under the sound of my voice, uh, let's talk about how we can reimagine success uh, or reimagine how success is measured for the students we, we serve because we are in service to them. Uh, this is a rubric I actually use for grading my students' assignments. I call it the five C's of hip hop, creativity, curiosity, connectivity, collaboration, and consciousness. So when I look at any of their writing, any of their assignments, and this is also how I show up in other spaces too, I think about how um, I prioritize and privilege and, 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 sell and um, uh, sort of uh, reward creativity, right? How are students thinking out, outside of the box? How are they bringing in pre-existing knowledge, right? Um, I teach a hip hop pedagogy. Um, uh, it's called a hip hop pedagogy poetics and remixes for higher education. So I teach a education course um, at Wake Forest where we explore, you know, higher ed through the prism of hip hop. And we write raps, uh, you know, that instead of having students write reflection papers, I have them write 16 bars, right? And we really start to break down what does it mean to view higher ed through the, this lens. But I also reward my students for writing raps in their other classes, for, you know, writing, um, uh, prioritizing cultural knowledge in other spaces as they navigate campus. I make sure that creativity doesn't start and stop with my experience on Tuesdays and Thursdays, right? I want them to make it a salient part of who they are. And if we can find ways to celebrate that, um, it could go a long way. Um, also prioritize curiosity, right? So to what extent are students asking questions? There's a lot of courses out there for my STEM folks in the room uh, who, who, who look for the right answers to things, answers, in, answer, the correct answers to very, very important questions that have implications for physical health and well-being. But also, I, I, I encourage my students to always, always, always end on a question to always ask for more, to always know that the work doesn't stop with just finding the answer. It's what you do with the answer that, that really matters. And so curiosity for me is something I prioritize in my classroom. Uh, connectivity. So how are students connecting what they're learning in your space to other classes and other experiences in their campus life? I always um, uh, provide extra credit participation opportunities for my students who um, are curious about hip hop or are curious about connecting these disparate parts of their learning experience. Um, I give them, you know, other lectures they could go to. Uh, I have them, there's a, there's a hip hop ed 
hashtag hip hop ed conversation that takes place every Tuesday night on Twitter. And I have them, you know, show up and watch that conversation to see how these scholars of hip hop from across the world are communicating with one another, right? And so I always try to find real world examples for how these things connect and show up in our space. Uh, collaboration. Hip hop does not happen in a vacuum, all right? So I, as a rapper, I am nothing without my producer. I'm nothing, we are nothing without the engineer who records everything. You know, all of this is synergistic and I encourage collaboration. I know group work might be incredibly difficult in this moment where we're doing more virtual and online learning, but if you can celebrate and prioritize collaboration, it really starts to show students that my work and my experience is inherently connected to my neighbor, to my friends, to my peers. And we start stop seeing each other as merely individuals navigating the same space. We see each other as a community coming toward a common goal together. And so collaboration is something that I don't just prioritize, I covet. Um, and certainly last but not least, consciousness, right? So not just, uh, again, arriving at an answer for the answer's sake, but what does that answer mean? How does this answer influence historically marginalized communities? How does this answer um, sort of impact people who might not be here in this room to hash this out, right? And how can we change that? Um, consciousness is something that is ever evolving, um, but if we don't allow students to sort of see the ways in which their uh, social consciousness is connected to curriculum, uh, I think we really miss the mark and undermine what I believe the purpose of higher education is, which is to engage uh, and create a more, uh, a more cooperative citizenry. Um, you can advance to the next slide. And so now I want to focus on my students, my homies, my, my, my big homies in the room, you know, who are here. Um, I want to focus on how success might be reimagined or, or measured in your own lives, right? Because when I started to see my college experience through this lens, it was like, oh, snap, like I could do this. I'm actually doing much better than my grades entail. And eventually that confidence I acquired um, in this, through this model sort of um, helped inform um, my ability to succeed in life beyond undergrad. So, um, there's five organizations that I want you to find, okay? Five organizations, I say organizations, but it could be opportunities, but find an organization that reaffirms a dominant identity of yours or your core values. At my university, we had an organization called Black Student Movement. Black Student Movement was uh, very important to me. You know, I attended a, a PWI, and because of that, I was looking for a space where I could feel sort of like reaffirmed, but also still part of a, a collective whole, um, and, and it really made the difference, right? So I had a, a group of people who were always there to reaffirm my racial and ethnic identity, but also other identities that mattered to me as a black as a black man at a uni at the university at that time. Um, I also encourage you to find an organization that affirms an identity you hope to express more openly. For me, that was my poetry group, right? That was something that lied dormant within me for a very long time because there was no. I had no, I, like I told people I rap, I had, you know, I'd be in the parking lot after school and high school and I played them little songs here and there, but there was no formal organization for me to, to, to wrestle with that identity that was coming out um, at the time. And so I encourage you to find an organization that allows you to express something you've always hoped to express. Um, find an organization that appeals to your style of self-care, right? So maybe it's intramurals, maybe it's working out, maybe it's there's a group of, of peers who hike, right, or do outdoors events, uh, and you consider that a form of self-care. You have to take care of you. Um, but in, in thinking about that, hopefully the, the institutions you attend and navigate have opportunities for you to uh, find an organization that appeals to that part of yourself. And then finally, um, find an organization that can help you overcome a perceived weakness, right? So if there's questions you have about um, uh, who you are yourself or, or things you might be struggling with. For me, this was certainly the writing center, the math help center, because numbers, I was talking with Lynn earlier this week about math and time math in particular. And although it's only a two hour difference between where I'm at in the universe and where she is, I for some reason could not figure out what 1130 was mountain time to Eastern okay. time. So I'm gonna own that, I'm gonna name that. So, right, so like, Making sure, but thank you, Lynn, for being so helpful. Now I know what time it is. Y'all know what time it is, too. Um, but I digress. Uh, just finding an organization or a group or opportunity that can help you overcome what it is you might be struggling with. Uh, we could advance to the next slide. Um, and really, these are just overall remixes for us to think about, for you to think about moving forward uh, as, as faculty and students in the shared space, reimagining how you assess um, students is really important. So what are you looking for when you survey, when you, you know, we have a lot of new data that we can um, sort of 
contend with as we uh, you know, are still in the throes of the pandemic, but can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? There's a lot of things we learned in this era of all virtual learning and online learning. Some things we might wanna keep, some things we might wanna let go of, some things we might wanna integrate moving forward. And asking the right questions as students round out this spring semester um, could be really important to us as higher ed professionals, thinking about what we want to hold on to um, as we move into this new post COVID era of, uh, of higher ed. Um, so make sure we're asking the, the, the questions that we really want to know the answers to. Um, reframing the language around recruitment. So going back to that original graph you saw about what admissions counselors are looking for, and, and this is not to criminalize or demonize admissions counselors, they do they have an incredibly tough job but how can we uh, reach out to students in a way that doesn't feel trite or um, you know, one-sided, right? Like how can we prioritize certain parts of the application that help the student feel like we are evaluating the fullness of who they are? So is it more, is it more writing prompts? Is it going test optional, right? What can we do to help students, especially our historically marginalized students, feel like you know, Southern Utah University or wherever they wanna go um, can feel like uh, a place they can call home? Um, reinvesting and that again that goes into reinvesting in our most vulnerable populations how are we um, in our advancement and development offices prioritizing uh, campaigns and funding opportunities that you know feed into scholarship programs that support these underrepresented communities how are we sort of thinking about serving indigenous populations whose land our universities are situated within and upon right like how can we continue to um, use our financial capital as a means of uh, giving opportunities to, to students who have felt historically left out. And um, last but certainly not least, re-engaging and reinvigorating the communities that our colleges are situated within. I find it very, very important that school, that colleges and universities um, live up to that expectation of serving the communities in which they're situated. It goes a long way. Um, and yeah, I'm just, uh, that, that's sort of where I'm at, happy to answer questions about that. Uh, I think we have one more, one more poem, one more slide, if I'm not mistaken, Lynn. Ah, yes, 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 yes. The reason for the season, why we, why we are gathered here. Um, I want to leave you with this. Uh, I got a couple more things I want to say before we go. What? Um, last but certainly not least, um, I think this is how we came to know one another. So I didn't want to uh, part without leaving this with you. Um, education, then, beyond all other devices of human origin, is a great equalizer of the conditions of men. Horace Mann, 1848. At the time of his remarks, I couldn't read, I couldn't write, any attempt to do so punishable by death. For generations, we have known of knowledge's infinite power, yet somehow we've never questioned the keeper of the keys, the guardians of information. Unfortunately, I've seen more dividing and conquering in this order of operations, a heinous miscalculation of reality. For some, the only difference between a classroom and a plantation it's time. How many times must we be made to feel like quotas, like tokens and coin phrases, diversity, inclusion? There are days I feel like one, like only a lonely blossom in a briar patch of broken promises. But hey, I've always been a thorn in the side of injustice, disruptive, talkative, a distraction with a passion that transcends the confines of my own consciousness beyond your curriculum, beyond your standards. I stand here, a manifestation of love in pain with veins pumping revolution. I am the strange fruit that grew too ripe for the poplar tree. I am a dream act, dream deferred, incarnate. I am a movement, an amalgam of memory America would care to forget my past alone won't allow me to sit still so my body like my mind cannot be contained as educators rather than raising your voices over the rustling of our chains take them off uncuff us unencumbered by the lumbering weight of poverty privilege policy and ignorance y'all I was in the seventh grade when Miss Parker told me Donovan we could put all your excess energy to good use and she introduced me to the sound of my own voice she gave me a stage a platform. She told me that our stories are the lattice that make it easier for us to touch the stars. So climb, grab them, keep climbing, grab them, spill your emotions in the Big Dipper and pour out your soul. Light up the world with your luminous allure. To educate requires Galileo-like patience. Today, when I look my students in the eyes, all I see are constellations. 
If you take the time to connect the dots, you can plot the true shape of their genius shining in the darkest hour. I look each of my students in the eyes and see the same light that aligned Orion's belt in the pyramids of Giza. I see the same twinkle that guided Harriet to freedom, y'all. I see them. Beneath their masks and their mischief exists an authentic frustration and enslavement. He has standardized assessments. At the core, none of us were meant to be common. We were born to be comets, darting across space and time, leaving our mark as we crash into everything. A crater is a reminder that something amazing happened right here, an indelible impact that shook up the world. <laughs> Are we not astronomers searching for the next shooting star? I teach in hopes of turning content into rocket ships, tribulations into telescopes so a child can see their true potential from right where they stand and injustice is telling them they are stars without acknowledging the night that surrounds them and justice is telling them education is the key. While you continue to change the locks, education is no equalizer. Rather, it is the sleep that precedes the American dream. So wake up, wake up. Wake up every child so they know of their celestial potential. I've been the black hole in the classroom for far too long, absorbing everything without allowing my light to escape. But those days are done. I belong among the stars and so do you. And so do they. Together, we can inspire galaxies of greatness for generations to come. So no, no, sky is not the limit. It is only the beginning. Lift off. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Yes! Thank you. Woo! Yes. Thank you so much. So, one more, I have a, one more slide for you, um, just with my contact information in case you want to reconnect or stay connected. Um, um, and I got to put myself on too, bro. I had an album come out last year. So, who would I be to not put you on, put you on my artistic endeavors? You feel me? So, um, again, I'm Donovan Livingston. Let's connect Instagram, Twitter at DLive87. Um, I do follow back, so please hit me up um, uh, on Facebook, too. I had an album come out last year entitled Molasses, available across multiple uh, streaming platforms. Um, I hope you enjoy, if you're a hip-hop head, hip-hop fan, and just curious about um, what the art has to offer. Molasses is a very, it's a personal exploration of um, uh, experiences, but uh, experiences of Blackness, but uh, it also talks about how sweet it is to be who we are. So I hope you enjoy. And last but certainly not least, I have one more thing for you to do is, audience. I said you were co-creating this space with me, Lynn, if you don't mind advancing to the next slide. Wherever you are in the corner of the universe, I just need you to hold one fist in the air if you are able and if you are willing. Hold one fist in the air and repeat after me. Sharpen your eyes. Sharpen your eyes. Tune your ears. Tune your ears. So you know what you see. So you know what you see. Understand what you hear. Understand what you hear. Minute by minute. Minute by minute. Hour by hour. Hour by hour. As we know our story. As we know our story. We know our power. We know our power. That's what it is. Peace and love, family. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I had a great time this afternoon. Donovan. If we got time. Thank you so much. I just, um, on behalf of everyone here, before we send you off, I, I want to say thank you for the art in your words. Thank you for your art. Thank you for your inspiration. Thank you for the clarity in your words. Um, the five C's and the organizations for students and then the mix up at the end. I, I hope you don't mind that I want to just share that with every committee that I'm involved in and, and really just pass that along because it's there's such inspiring and practical, meaningful ways to inspire us to, to make our spaces uh, better, you know, in, in every way. So thank you. Thank you for that very, very much. Um, also for everyone here and everyone listening, um, I want to make you aware that we do have liftoff available here for purchase. Um, and we will be doing the President's Book Club today at uh, 4 p.m. in Braithwaite 208. Uh, Donovan will also be meeting with students in the Center for Diversity and Inclusion tomorrow morning from 9 to 11, uh, and then also in a class of mine at 11 as well. So um, we, we thank you for that extra time and also our gratitude so much to the Eccles Foundation uh, who has provided uh, and has really made this event possible and all of these extra visits that you're doing to really make your visit as powerful and impactful uh, and, and personalized. So uh, thank you.
you so much to the Eccles Foundation. Thank you to Donovan and um, thank you for everything. And I look forward, we'll also be on the radio today at 3 p.m. And that will be a podcast. And I, with that, we'll sign off until our next hour. But Donovan, on behalf of everyone, we are gonna send you off. Thank you, thank you, thank you.